It's no news that Mexican cartels are some of the world's deadliest, so the last thing you want to do is piss one off. That was the situation a famous teen got himself into before receiving a reality check. This is the story of how this guy pissed off one of Mexico's most dangerous cartels. The story of Fofo Marquez. The world of online influencing thrives on people doing outlandish things. From Mr. Beast performing crazy challenges to pranksters pulling off all sorts of tricks on people, it's all about getting a reaction. One Mexican influencer who seems to have mastered the art of drawing reactions is TikToker Rodolfo Fofo Marquez. Rodolfo Fofo Marquez, aka King of Mexico, aka Millionaire Boy, is a Mexican social media influencer with over 6 million followers across several platforms. Almost every post on these accounts revolves around the guy flaunting his wealth by showing off wild pets, expensive wine bottles, or fancy sports cars. The degree of extravagance that Fofo Marquez displays on social media is enough to make anyone ask, how did this kid get so wealthy? The answer is simple. He was born into a wealthy family. His dad and namesake, Rodolfo Marquez Sr., was an oil businessman and majority shareholder of the Total Gas Station chain ref. Rodolfo Sr. also had a privileged background, as his father was also a millionaire. Fofo Marquez's grandfather, Everardo Marquez, founded the 10-pack shoe company Company, which began as a family business and quickly grew into a nationwide company. They specialized in creating safe shoes and boots for industrial workers. One of the weird things you'll observe as you go through Fofo Marquez's accounts is that, unlike many influencers of his ilk, he never posts anything family-related. His posts strictly revolve around his life and that of his friends, and there might be a good reason for that. Online publication Plumas Atomicus reported that his father asked him not to reveal the personal details of any family member he adhered. Strictly to this rule, only breaking it when Rodolfo Sr. died of stage 4 cancer on November 9, 2022. For a while, he had his followers convinced that his time as an influencer was over, writing, My stage of the millionaire boy is over and a new stage is coming for me, which is to become a man. I had never uploaded a photo of my father, but some had been leaked of who he was or whose son I was. Thank you all who lived the experience of the networks and accompanied me in this hobby that is over. I will no longer have time to make content. I say goodbye to all of you. Thanks for your support. It is time to become a man. He even briefly opened a new personal account. The old Fofo Marquez was gone, and this new person was possibly set to take over his father's empire and live as a mature, responsible young. Never mind, homeboy was soon in the Middle East enjoying the World Cup, drinking from Moet bottles and posting exotic rides. Before long, the new personal account was deleted. Old habits die hard, I guess. This was probably the only way Rodolfo knew how to live life, causing a scene, seeking attention, and trying to be that cool guy. This was what brought him fame and endorsements, and had in the past put him on the Jalisco New Generation Cartel's radar. We have closed it for ourselves. This is what I want to demonstrate what money and power can do. That is, literally, I closed it here because I wanted to. On Thursday, 7th of July, 2022, the King of Mexico took several of his sports cars for a spin around Guadalajara, but he had a mischievous plan in mind. Instead of going somewhere in particular, he chose to park his cars on one side of the Matute Remus Bridge. I mean, all three lanes blocked for no reason in particular. He didn't have engine failures. He didn't want to race. He didn't want to do anything but prove that he was that powerful. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment action either. No, this was a thought-out plan to block the road for content. A few seconds before stopping, he spoke to his driver saying, we are going to close it. We are going to start dancing, doing TikToks. So well, you can see once again what money can do here in Mexico. Soon, he stopped his cars, went onto the road, and continued filming himself while other road users kept honking in frustration. At that moment, he was right. Money was king in Mexico, and he could do whatever he wanted, until... Attached to that tweet sent by the username at Bambinors contained the link to another tweet sent by an account allegedly run by the CJNG. That account has since been blocked, but that wasn't before letting Fofo Marquez know that what he did was an act they didn't tolerate, and that they were the ones in charge of Jalisco, so he couldn't come in and do whatever he wanted. The authenticity of the tweet was never confirmed before Twitter blocked the account. However, it caused the influencer to upgrade his security detail and hurry out of Jalisco and back to the relative safety of Mexico City. In a video with popular YouTuber Dominguez he revealed, We increased security after the problem I had, and I can't even go out. They're here 24-7. In the video, the influencer noted that his family had made the decision to increase the security team, concluding by saying, A lot of money, a lot of problems. Unfortunately, Mexicans are very envious that when you are at the top, people want to see you well, but not better than them. Of course, bro, the money caused the problem. But let's back up a bit. Who was this cartel that got a wealthy influencer so scared in the first place? Who was the CJNG?
The Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or CJNG for short, is a cartel based in Jalisco, Mexico. The group, formerly known as Los Matazetas, is generally seen as Mexico's most dangerous criminal organization and the second most powerful drug cartel after the Sinaloa Cartel. The CJNG is headed by Mexico's most wanted man, Nemesio Oseguera Cervantes, also known as El Mencho. This is the same El Mencho who has a $10 million bounty from the U.S. government on his head. Born in July 1966, El Mencho is one of six boys boys born and raised in a poor family of farm workers in Aguililla. The small city, known as the world's avocado capital and located in Mikoacan, has a population of fewer than 20,000 people. Indeed, El Mencho's parents were also avocado farmers, and he dropped out of school after the sixth grade to pick avocados. Seeing how little his family earned, young El Mencho knew from a very young age that small-scale avocado farming couldn't give him the life he wanted. So, like many young Mexican boys with lofty dreams, little guidance, and lots of bad influence on the streets, he started started engaging in illegal activities. Soon, he started peddling drugs and doing small-time gigs for cartels. By the time he was 14, he was serving as a guard for their marijuana plantations. A few years later, El Mencho decided to move abroad and pursue the American dream, you know, the illegal kind. So, he immigrated illegally to California in the 1980s as a teenager. To evade authorities, he used different names like Miguel Valadez, Roberto Salgado, and Jose Lopez Prieto, a creative man. While in the U.S., he lived in the San Francisco Bay area, where he was arrested several times. His first run-in with the law was in 1986 when he was arrested for stolen property and carrying a loaded gun. Another encounter followed in 1989. This time, he was nabbed for selling narcotics and was deported to Mexico several months later. However, he found his way back into the U.S. and was arrested with his brother Abraham for federal drug charges in Sacramento, California. The future drug lord pled guilty to the charges and was sentenced to five years imprisonment at the Big Spring Correctional Center in Texas. He was released on parole role after three years and again deported to Mexico at age 30. Now back in his home country, El Mencho joined the local police forces of Tomatian and Cabo Corrientes in Chalisco State. Not long after this, he made a critical career switch, joining the Milenio Cartel as a full-time member. At the time, the Milenio Cartel was closely associated with the Sinaloa Cartel. It was under the direct control of Ignacio Coronel Villarreal, the founder and leader of the Sinaloa Cartel. However, after Villarreal died in 2010, the resultant power vacuum led to a bloody power contest. The two most dominant factions of the disbanded group were La Resistencia, headed by Ramiro Pozos El Molca, and a group of El Mencho loyalists, a battle that El Mencho won. You see, in his relatively short time in the group, El Mencho had become extremely influential. He allegedly joined the group's assassin or Sicario squad and soon led one of its cells in Guadalajara as a cartel. Another strategic move was marrying Rosalinda Gonzalez Valencia, a member of the cartel's founding family. So, when the Civil War started, he had the support of the Valencia family and their faction, known as Los Quinas now. While the CJNG had issues with La Resistencia, the group's hatred for Los Zetas was on another level. In fact, their earlier name, Los Matazetas, literally means the Zeta killers. Los Zetas was a group initially meant to be an enforcement arm of the Gulf Cartel and consisted of Mexican army commandos who deserted their ranks. Soon, they became so powerful, outnumbering and outclassing the Gulf Cartel in every possible way. It didn't take long for Los Zetas to start acting autonomous expanding their operations to include actions that the cartel didn't support, such as murder, kidnapping, and extortion. When the cartel leaders tried to rein them in and reduce their influence, it led to a civil war. Another major cause of dissension within the group was that the Gulf Cartel wanted an alliance with the rival Sinaloa Cartel. However, Los Zetas didn't want this, probably because they'd long been on the front lines against the Sinaloans. Eventually, the split occurred, and Los Zetas grew rapidly, eventually overtaking the Sinaloans as the cartel with the largest geographical presence. It was therefore no surprise that Los Zetas were the CJNG's prime target in its earliest days, dubbing themselves Los Mata Zetas. The group's first public appearance was in June 2009, when they killed three alleged members of Los Zetas police were alerted to an abandoned truck that contained several dead bodies. On further investigation, they realized the corpses of three men with a cardboard containing a message that read, We are the new group Mata Zetas, Zeta killers, and we are against kidnapping and extortion, and we will fight them in all states for a cleaner Mexico. This pattern of dropping messages after executing victims has been a trademark of the CJNG. They probably saw it as a way to maintain their public image as a group for the Mexican
Mexican people. In the spring of 2011, they declared war on all other Mexican cartels and stated their intention to control the city of Guadalajara. In September of that same year, two trucks containing 35 bodies were left at an underpass in Boca del Rio Veracruz. Most of the bodies showed signs of torture, and some had their hands tied. The CJNG took responsibility for the killings and left a message with the bodies that read, No more extortions, no more killings of innocent people, Zetas in the state of Veracruz and politicians helping them. This is going to happen to you, or we can shoot you as we did to you guys before, too. People of Veracruz, do not allow yourselves to be extorted. Do not pay for protection. If you do, is because you want to. This is the only thing these people, Los Zetas, can do. This is going to happen to all the Zetas who continue to operate in Veracruz. This territory has a new proprietor. If it's all a front, no one is safe. If you're watching this video and thinking to yourself, these CJNG guys aren't so bad after all. They want the city to be void of stupid influencers and they also deal with groups that extort the people. I have to ask you to hold that thought for a moment. You see, this strategy of trying to win social capital is a strategy many cartels and criminal organizations regularly use. The Yakuza were among the first to send relief supplies to victims of Japan's earthquake and tsunami. In El Chapo's hometown, many of the natives saw him as a benevolent wealthy man. And even Pablo Escobar was seen as a a hero by thousands. According to renowned Mexican journalist Jose Reveles, these aides are a propaganda strategy aimed to show their presence. According to him, violence and benevolence both serve the same purpose for cartels, to exert their influence on the territories they seek to control as they face competition from the government as well as rival criminal organizations. From Pablo Escobar to the Yakuza to the CJNG, none of these groups are ever really looking out for the people. The CJNG was never some vigilante group that wanted to root out the low Zetas for the good of Jalisco and Mexico. To them, Los Zetas was a rival gang that needed to be taken out, but they needed a front. They always need a front. One of the greatest proofs that the CJNG only had their interests in mind is their relationship with the government and security forces. The group inflicted one of the worst attacks against the Mexican police force on the 6th of April, 2015. On that day, 15 police officers were ambushed and killed by the CJNG. The group of policemen was returning from a mission in coastal communities when their trucks were blocked on the road by the car cartel's vehicle. Dozens of cartel members appeared from seemingly nowhere, killing 15 officers and injuring several more. The ambush location was so strategic that the policemen couldn't defend themselves, retreat, or take cover. This attack rocked the Mexican government to its core and was an exhibition of just how bloodthirsty the cartel was. This prompted the armed forces to make greater attempts to track El Mencho. However, that didn't turn out well for them either. About two weeks later, on the morning of May 1st, some of his bodyguards fired a rocket-propelled grenade at a military helicopter that was tracking their boss. The result was a crashed aircraft, the first of such an attack that the Mexican army had suffered, and proof of just how powerful the group was. They didn't stop at security forces, too, going after government officials and lawmakers who passed laws that weren't in their favor. Their most high-profile kill came one week before Christmas in 2020, in an attack against the governor of Jalisco, Aristoteles Sandoval. The CJNG's beef with Sandoval was a result of the 2015 helicopter operation. He was governor of the state at the time, and ordered the operation in a bid to curtail the cartel's influence in his state. Sandoval was killed in a restaurant in Jalisco. However, the murder investigations were seriously hampered when police arrived at the crime scene to find that it had been tampered with. Apparently, the restaurant owner had ordered his staff members to wipe the crime scene. The owner and staff were taken in for questioning by the police, but no one was immediately prosecuted. Journalists, too, are not free from the cartel's threats. In August 2021, a news anchor for Millennio Television named Azucena Uresta received received a message on Twitter from the cartel. The video, which has been blocked on the platform, features six heavily armed men wearing all black clothes and masks, and a spokesperson for El Mencho. The spokesperson read the following words from a script. Azucena Uresti, wherever you are, I'll get you, and I will make you eat your words, even if they accuse me of femicide because you do not know me. Ruben Oseguera Cervantes, I'm not a debt collector or extortionist, nor am I a kidnapper. As a representative of the Jalisco cartel new generation, I address this. Message directly to Millenio. I am not against freedom of expression, but I am against whoever attacks me directly. This threat was a response to Miss Uresti's news coverage of the vigilante groups in Mikoacan. On their part, the CJNG believed that the vigilante groups weren't looking out for the people. Instead, they were disguised extortioners and kidnappers. The spokesperson even mentioned how Hippolito Mora, one of the vigilante group's organizers, recently distanced himself from the group. So, according to the spokesperson, what they wanted from the news outlet was fair coverage of the events. 
Threats like this are commonplace in Mexico, which has consistently been ranked as the deadliest country to be a journalist. On her part, Miss Uresti didn't back down. She went further to express her solidarity and support for other threatened journalists in the country. Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador even chimed in on the matter. Perhaps the president's support was enough to dissuade the group, or they just didn't feel like feeding Miss Uresti her words again. For whatever reason, the CJNG didn't make good on this particular threat. Now, while it's understandable that the cartel goes after government officials, rival cartels, journalists, and security forces. They also terrorized civilians. In 2018, three students were kidnapped and killed in Guadalajara by alleged CJNG members because of suspicions that they were members of a rival cartel. CJNG vs. the Pirate of Culiacan. Fofo. Marquez's humility and decision to upgrade security was wise, considering the CJNG's track record with influencers that crossed them. The last high-profile altercation between the cartel and an influencer was in 2017 when Juan Luis Lagunas Rosales publicly insulted El Mencho. The 17-year-old was, in some ways, similar to Fofo Marquez. His accounts featured posts that were mostly about catching fun and partying. However, their stories couldn't be any more different. Unlike Fofo Marquez, who was born in the lush parts of Mexico City, Juan Luis was born in Villa Juarez, a rural part of the Mexican state of Sinaloa. For those who might be unaware, this is the cartel capital of Mexico and the base of the Sinaloa cartel, run by notorious drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Anyway, Juan Luis had a rough childhood. He never knew his father, and his mother abandoned him with his grandmother as a child. He left home as a 15-year-old, never finishing high school before moving to the neighboring municipality of Culiacan, where he started washing cars to make a living. Here, he adopted the nickname that many people came to know him by El Pirata de Culiacan, or the Pirate of Culiacan. Even if Juan Luis was just 17, he engaged in activities that many people twice his age would not even dare. He tattooed his arms, a pirate on one, a tiger on the other. He posted pictures of large guns, half-naked women, and luxury cars on Instagram. The drinking age in Mexico is 18, but El Pirata de Culiacan drank and publicly took drugs as if he had no limits, and to make himself look a bit older, he drew a beard on his face. Juan Luis's baby face and clownish behavior were entertaining to many people. He had nearly 790,000 followers on Facebook, 37,000 on Twitter, and nearly 323,000 on Instagram. Soon, his social media fame earned him invitations to more parties and spots in music videos and promotional events. Soon, the teenager had become an alcohol addict, often posting videos on social media that showed him downing bottles of beer and whiskey. In some of those clips, he got drunk to the point that he passed out. As expected, when teenagers get drunk, they say all kinds of stupid stuff, and soon the self-acclaimed pirate of Culiacan said, the most stupid thing. Yeah, bad idea. Juan Luis dropped that video on the 9th of November, 2017, and immediately it went viral. Even his most loyal followers knew that he had gone too far. Why would anyone dare insult El Mencho? But to their surprise, nothing happened to the pirate of Culiacan for days and weeks. Perhaps El Mencho had bigger fish to fry and didn't care much about what a drunk teenager had to say about him. And so Juan Luis continued to live his life as usual, attending parties and posting ridiculous videos. However, his last post on December 18th was literally his most life-altering one. In it, he announced that he would be at the Menta Tu Cantaros Bar, located in Los Cajetes on the border of Zapopan, Jalisco. The post also detailed his time of arrival, probably so that his followers could meet up with him for a good time. However, the people who honored his invitation were not those he had in mind. Not long after Juan Luis stepped in and was partying with friends, things went downhill fast. Some armed men burst in and shot him several times. The teenager died instantly, having been hit by 15 to 18 bullets. He was so badly wounded that the authorities had to identify him by his tattoos. Even though the room was packed with people, only one other person was injured. This was clearly a targeted hit. While prosecutors could not definitively determine the perpetrators of the act and their motives, the link to El Mencho is just too eerie to ignore. Some reporters asked the Attorney General of Jalisco, Raul Sanchez, if the links to El Mencho were true. His response, apparently there is a video where he makes statements. It is unknown if he is related to this fact. It is being investigated. The videos are being analyzed. His videos are very aggressive. An investigation is underway to see how he arrived at the bar, who he arrived with to find out what happened. Yeah, no much investigation needed here, sir. I think we already have an idea of what happened. The last person anyone wants to piss off in Mexico is the most wanted man in Mexico, who also oversees one of the most brutal groups in the country.
Consequences for the stupid stunt. It wasn't just the CJNG and passers-by who weren't pleased. Even government authorities didn't like this publicity stunt. The mayor of Guadalajara, Pablo Limas, denounced the influencer's actions. He was arraigned before a court, where he was sentenced to 12 hours of community work, which he carried out under the same bridge he blocked. In addition, he had to make contributions worth 35,000 pesos to the Villa's Miraval Children's Stay. Soon after making the post, TikTok even banned his account temporarily, but it has since been reinstated. Safe to say the backlash came hard from all corners. Anyway, after much backlash from fans, government officials, and even a cartel, Fofo Marquez took the video down a day after posting it. He apologized to fans and the people of Jalisco for what he did. Fofo seems to have learned his lesson too. Since the whole bridge incident, he has returned to the regular posts that have him posing in clubs with expensive wine bottles or standing in front of expensive cars. All things considered, I'll say Fofo Marquez had a better outcome than most people who have crossed El Mencho's path. I mean, I'd rather do community service for a few hours and pay a fine than get 18 bullet holes in me. If you enjoy content like this, click on the videos showing. On your screen now,